Today on the podcast, we're interviewing my great friend and one of my all-time favorite leaders, Andy Stanley, and we're talking all about parenting. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the podcast. Yes, I'm so glad you're here. So I've known Andy for 20 years. I've had a front row seat to watch you and Sandra lead and love your kids so well. So I'm excited for this interview today. Yeah, it's hard for pastors to hide anything about their family. And you're, and also your audience should know if they don't already that you're a preacher's kid as well. I am a preacher's so kid. So we're both PKs. Raising kids. So. Yes, and it is hard to hide anything. It's a pressure to be yeah. a preacher's kid, for sure, for sure. So tell us a little bit about your kids. They're grown. Yep. Out of uh, the nest. Tell us I've about it. My oldest isn't married, but my right. second child is his son. Garrett's married. My daughter, my youngest, is married. And Andrew has a serious girlfriend. They're all in their 20s, um, all out of the house. Mm-hmm. And as of this year, in the middle of all the craziness of this year, um, my oldest bought a townhouse, so now all three of them live in their own homes that they oh, have purchased or their spouses. And yeah. so uh, it's it's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, you you got a taste of, a, of that. It's kind of a nice feeling, it actually, is. when they all move out. Yeah. You think I, it'll never happen. I but. had uh, a mutual friend texted me. He moved recently, used to be on our staff, uh-huh. and said, is it bad that I'm looking forward to being an empty nester? I'm like, no. It's it, so fun. <laughs> it means that you and your wife still like each other. Yes. I know you love each other, but you still like each other. So no, it's, it's, it's a great thing. But what we're going to talk about today certainly sets us up. Yeah. For whether or not yeah. we still like each other. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to talk to parents uh, who have kids of all ages. Some will be preschool, moving into high school, and grown. Yep. So let's kind of start at the beginning. I know early uh, when your kids were little, you and Sandra made some decisions to like uh, put some margin in your family life, and you kind of set some pretty pretty strict boundaries around yep. how you were going to work and do life. So tell us a little bit about that and, and why you were thinking that way. Yeah, well, part of it, what we ju- were just talking about, I grew up as a preacher's kid, and um, I didn't tell Sandra when we were getting married, oh, yeah, by the way, if we have kids, they're going to be preacher's kids. I kind of held that back. It (laughs) dawned on her sometime in (laughs) the first few years of marriage, like, oh, my goodness, our kids will be preacher's kids. So early on, we had this little saying, we would say, no for now, but not forever. Mm -hmm. No for now, but not forever. So when we had little kids, we just categorically eliminated some things. Mm -hmm. Instead of, hey, are we busy Thursday night? Are we busy next weekend? We just, there were categories we just decided, you know what? Those are good things, but in this season, this is a no for now, but Mm -hmm. it's a not a no forever, which I think allowed us to say no for now. So um, there were just, and I don't want to give you my list because Mm -hmm. They're not bad things or wrong things, right. but we knew, hey, we're not going to be engaged with our kids the way we want to if we're kind of making up the schedule as we go along. So we did no for now, not forever. Also in those early years, and this um, was unusual because we would hear from our friends it's unusual, mm-hmm. every year we would go somewhere by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason we knew that was so unusual is when we would tell, um, like, you know, parents on our kids' sports teams, Mm -hmm. hey, we're not going to be here next weekend for the game. Uh, Sandra and I are going, and they would say, just the two of you? And we're like, yeah. And they would, they would inevitably, they would all (laughs) moan and go, we haven't been anywhere by ourselves in five years, Mm -hmm. seven years. And we're like, that's why you're not sitting with each other on the bleachers. You know, it's like, (laughs) so that we made that a priority. And that's difficult to leave home. Yeah, leave, find Who's going to take care of the kids? Yeah. And, you know, all these notes and mm-hmm. checks and mm-hmm. here's $4 for this. And yep. it's, it's complicated. That was a priority. And then the other thing is something we learned um, in a course we took when we first started, when, when Aunt Sandra was um, pregnant with Andrew, our oldest, we took this class. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things they talked about they called it couch time, which I hate the name, yeah. but that was what they called it, couch <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah. But the point was that when a, a husband and wife come home uh-huh. at the end of the day, that they prioritize their conversation with each other yeah. instead of allowing the kids to be central. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't necessarily sit on the couch, but we got in the habit of mm-hmm. our kids knew, you know, in my case, dad's coming home. Yep. And Sandra and I would sit down somewhere and just talk. And the yeah. kids knew, okay, he's available in a few minutes. Yeah. And I love that. That and then as the kids were old enough to stay mm-hmm. in the house by themselves for 30 minutes, yeah. you know, still pretty young, we'd get in the car and just drive off. Yeah. And go get some coffee, drive mm-hmm. around for 35, you know, 40 minutes, come back, have yeah. dinner. We didn't have a consistent date night. A lot of couples yeah. do that, which yeah. I think is great. I did too. But we didn't have, you know, every Thursday night date night, but mm-hmm. we had that consistent, you know kind of couch time, for lack of a better phrase. So those were some of the things that we did systematically early on. 
I, uh, Gary and I did a lot of that too. And we were lucky enough to have grandparents close by. Mm. So that kind of helped us. Yeah, that helped us. And I'm a grandma now, so I have a lot of grandkids. And I find myself gravitating when they ask me, can you watch us for them to have a date night? I want to say yes, because I think it's so important. I really do. And again, it's one of those things, if it's not planned, prioritized, it is not going to automatically happen. Life's just too busy. Okay, so in the preschool years, I know parents are just often living for bedtime. They're just yep. like, get those kids in their jammies out of the bath into bed. Uh, but what are some like consistent habits that you did that you think kind of leveraged those early years to like lay that healthy foundation for your kids? Well, you just pointed to the tension, which I think is mm-hmm. somewhat the answer to the question, and it is bedtime. So the critical the critical interaction times for parents and kids or for family is dinner time and bedtime, dinner time and bedtime. And interestingly enough, you said preschool, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that those two times continue to be critical times in our family all the way through high school, dinner time and bedtime. We can talk a little bit more about the later years later. But the the challenge is, and I'm not saying anything every parent doesn't already know, at bedtime, we're ready to go to bed. At bedtime, we're so tired or we're trying to get them down early so we can at least have, you know, some converse, adult conversation. Yeah. Um, but rushing bedtime is a mistake. It's mm-hmm. it's a temptation. And I mean, it was a temptation every night because I was so tired and I would try to trick our kids into going to bed earlier and trick them into letting me leave the room. Mm-hmm. But it's so interesting at bedtime, that's the time when our kids are like, no, 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 don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Of course, yeah. they're stalling. They don't want to go to bed. But in terms of important conversations, dinner time and bedtime, and on the dinner time piece for just a minute, when our kids are at home with us, the goal of dinner time is not eating. Mm-hmm. The goal of dinner time is conversation. And this is why I think it's often a mistake for parents and families to get in the habit of going out for dinner because they think, well, the point is to make sure the kids are fed. Well, yeah, maybe. But yeah. that that unlike breakfast or lunch, that dinner time opportunity is a unique time that I think has to be protected and cherished. And that doesn't mean you never you never go out. But the routine, as much as possible, should be sitting down at the table as a family because there's conversations that happen there that just don't happen any other place. And if you start that early and kind of create the the pattern or the habit of what happens at dinner, it, it truly carries on into middle school and high school years. So again, those those critical times are dinner time and bedtime. And I love how you say it carries on because I found that to be so true in my home too. After a while, bedtime became them plopping on my bed to talk at the end of the day, but those were still moments in the day that was a pattern formed in our home for sure. And and I don't want either of us to break down in tears while we're having this conversation, (laughs) but you miss that. You You miss that because those are tender, vulnerable moments. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the problem is I was so tired and, and Sandra's like, you know, Put, you know, the earlier, the better. Is it dark yet? You know, can we, how can we make the house darker? You know, there are people in the studio with the shaking their heads like, yeah, we, we get that. Yeah. But to rush those times, um, you know, it, it's a mistake. Yeah, So I agree. That's so good. Um, okay, so kind of at every stage of a child's life, there's sort of a different responsibility in parenting mm-hmm. or a different relationship you have with your kids. So describe for me a little bit like how you sort of viewed the preschool years, the elementary years, and on into their student years, and maybe even young adults. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something we were taught, mm-hmm. and I don't remember where we learned this. It may have been that that early class we took. But we we took this um, almost literally that the, it and we broke it into four stages mm-hmm. or this class broke it into four stages. There's the discipline years, mm-hmm. the training years, the coaching years, and the friendship years. Mm-hmm. The discipline years, uh, training, coaching, friendship. And Kendra, we've been in ministry long enough to know what happens when families mm-hmm. either skip one of those, especially one of the first two, yeah. or get them out of order. We've seen what happens when parents want to have friendship years before they Mm -hmm. do the discipline and coaching years. Yeah. Um, And so these these are critical stages. And and again, the ages, that depends on the maturity, Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, and even gender of a child. But those first three or four years, uh, five years are the discipline years, training, coaching, and um, friendship. And if I could say something about the training years Mm -hmm. for just a minute, one of the things that 
that we saw done not well, and I think is one of the things that motivated us to get this right, is we saw parents that expected their kids to know how to do things or know how to behave in a way Mm -hmm. um, that they never trained them to do. Mm -hmm. And I always compared it to sports. I coached a lot of baseball, Mm -hmm. even though I knew nothing about baseball. And you, I would see dads especially um, kind of lose their temper at their their kids or their sons mm-hmm. for not being able to perform. And I always wondered, well, have you spent any time training? I mean, yeah. you're you're disciplining and you're chastising <laughs> and you're losing your temper, but have you trained? So literally, and this sounds so goofy, we would spend time training our children to mm-hmm. obey. Mm-hmm. We trained first time obedience because when our kids are little, first time obedience can be a matter of life and death. Mm-hmm. Um, so we trained first time obedience. We trained what you do when somebody comes to the door. I would go outside, ring the doorbell. I'd say, Mr. Johnson's coming over. I'd go outside, pretend to be Mr. Johnson. Mm-hmm. We would train shaking hands. We would tra- literally train first time obedience because to expect something of our children that we have not trained them to do frustrates our mm-hmm. kids and frustrates us. So discipline, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, when our kids are super little, th- there's just, there's not a lot of training because they're yeah. still figuring out conversation. And mm-hmm. But there has to be, there has to be those those years, especially five, six, seven, eight, all maybe up through almost middle school, where we're training them how to behave and how to behave in public, how to show respect. Mm-hmm. But if we don't train and we expect, we frustrate yeah. our children. And we, we've we seen that. So those are sort of the, you know, it's the discipline years, training years, coaching years, friendship years. I feel like that kind of ties back to dinner time too. Even though it's conversation rich, you're also training your children how to yes. have a conversation with an adult yes. about their day or about things that are interesting. And not interrupt, let the other person. Yeah. One of the things I try to teach my kids to do, and again, personalities, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, are, are part of how well or how quickly kids latch on to things. I try to teach our kids to ask questions. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about that. So <laughs> Andrew, when he was, uh, he was, we were picking up this young lady who he kind of thought was cute. That he was very young, and and she was his same age, which meant she was way more mature than he was. <laughs> and so we were going to pick her up. She was real cute, and I could tell he was nervous. And we were going to this picnic. This, and so I said, "Now, Andrew, you need to think of some questions to ask when she gets in the back seat. Just have some questions in your mind. So otherwise, I knew he was just going to sit back there and be frozen." <laughs> So he said, okay, okay. So do, I said, do you have some questions? Yes, sir. And I knew he didn't want to tell me what they were. So we get in the car <laughs> and in the back seat. I forget how young they were. And he says, I, I hear him back there. He says, do you watch Lost? <laughs> and she said, no. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> he had, he had, he had one up. question. It was like, do you watch Lost? No. End of conversation. So anyway, um, but again, it's, it's anticipating what we want our kids to know and thinking, oh, yeah, they need to be taught how to do this rather than simply expected to get it right. So, yeah. Okay. So the elementary years are for teaching and training our kids. So what are two or three things that were just like specifically on your mind you wanted to make sure your kids knew? Well, as I mentioned super early, that first time obedience, um, instead of, so we didn't become what some people refer to as a threatening, repeating parent. Mm -hmm. It drove me crazy. No offense to some of your audience to hear parents (laughs) go, now, Johnny, I need you to sit down. One, two. Well, what you're teaching Johnny is that he doesn't need to sit down until you get to three. I mean, that was like, what? Anyway, so first time obedience, super important. Um, But backing up or sort of the broader context, in our family, and people, again, think we make this up. We had we just had two rules, especially mm-hmm. when they were young. And again, this carried right into middle school and high school. We didn't know it at the time. And our two rules were honor your mother mm-hmm. and never tell a lie. Mm-hmm. That was it. Um, honor your mother is a trick, trickle-down rule. If our children learn first how to honor anyone, that's huge. And if they honor their mother— um, it trickles down. They they know what honoring another person looks like. And it was super important to me, to us, that they know how to honor a person. Again, we parents are mortified when their children in public don't show respect and honor. Yeah. But have you ever taught what honor looks like? I mean, mm-hmm. Kendra, we know adults that haven't figured we, it out yes, yet, right? right? Because no one trained them right. or taught them. At honor. So we had these two rules, honor mom and never tell a lie. And our reason for not telling a lie was because lying breaks the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I would say to Andrew and Garrett and Allie, you know what? I don't want to ever break my relationship with you. We don't want to break our relationship with you either, mm-hmm. Daddy. I said, well, that's what lying does. Lying breaks a relationship. So those 
you know, teaching how to honor, Mm -hmm. link to honor your mother and never tell a lie. Those were kind of the the, sort of the big pieces. And um, those two things cover a multitude of, you know, potential error. So. Yeah, I love that. All right, Andy. So everyone asks us about discipline and they really want like a formula. Like you were saying earlier, yep. if my child does A, what do I do? What is B? And you and I both know we have a house full of kids that kids need different things from us at different times. Yep. Uh, so what was your guiding principle? Like what was in your mind and heart when you were disciplining your children? So two pieces of this. Mm-hmm. Um, First, what to discipline for. Right. Um, There's a difference. And again, we learned this way back. There's a difference between disobedience and childishness. Mm -hmm. When a child is acting childish, they're not being disobedient. They're acting childish. Mm -hmm. So it's a mistake to discipline a child for being childish Mm -hmm. because that's not disrespect or disobedience. That's just childishness. So making that differentiation early is super important. But we were having dinner one night with a couple their daughter, um, we didn't have children yet, and their daughter acted up and dad got up, picked her up. We were at a restaurant, disappeared for a few minutes, came back. She was remarkably <laughs> well-behaved after that. And Sandra said um, to the wife, um, how do you know when to discipline your children? Mm-hmm. Um, we were very impressed with him as parents. And she said, we discipline for three things. And we latched onto this. She said, we discipline just for three things, disobedience, mm-hmm. disrespect, and dishonesty, the three Ds, Dis- disobedience, disrespect, and dishonesty. Everything else is basically a learning opportunity or a coaching opportunity or a training opportunity, but those three things um, we discipline for. So we we latched onto that, That was and that was super clear. The other thing that we, because of our goal for um, parenting that maybe we'll talk about in a few minutes, it's so important, and this is, and again, because I was in student ministry for so many years and watched so many parents struggle with their middle school and high school students, I think that's why what I'm about to say next was so important to me. The goal of discipline mm-hmm. is not payback, and the goal of discipline isn't so I feel like, oh, I did something. The goal of discipline is relationship restoration, mm-hmm. and this is so important because every time a child disobeys or is disrespectful or dishonoring, they have they have damaged a relationship. And so because they've damaged a relationship, the goal of discipline should be to restore the relationship. Mm-hmm. This is why simply taking things away, putting kids on restriction, time out, all of those things, there may be a place for them in certain circumstances, but that those things never restore a relationship. Taking away PlayStation, um, taking the door off a kid's room, you know, the door off their bedroom. Again, in, in, in extreme circumstances, I don't want to, you know, say those are never appropriate. But if the response to our child's misbehavior doesn't in some way restore the relationship, mm-hmm. we're not training them to restore a relationship. And again, I know I've said this twice already. We know adults who never learned how yeah. to restore a broken relationship. They know there's something wrong with their marriage. They know there's something wrong with their brother-in-law. They really don't know what to do. It's just yeah. broken. So discipline the goal of discipline should be to restore the relationship. Now, the problem with that is how to do that is not always uh, immediately apparent. Right. It takes more creativity. It generally takes more time, but it is a lot more effective than simply being angry, taking things away, or putting our kids on restriction. So I'd love to tell one story yeah, about go this. For it. Um, we have two stories, but probably only time for one. And Sandra gets all the credit for this. So, <laughs> for example, uh, we came home one night, and our babysitter that we used a lot, who was really a friend of our family, uh, we could tell something was wrong. We got home. The kids were asleep. And turns out, as we kind of prodded, the boys had been very disrespectful. I mean, and they were, I forget how young they were, but they were little. I mean, still have babysitters. And so um, she left. We apologized. She's like, oh, it's not a big deal. We're like, it's a big deal. Yeah. So what do you do, Mm -hmm. right? You just take stuff away, you know, can't do this. You know, so Sandra, really, I get up the next morning, I go to work. She wakes him up early. The boys, it was just the boys, not Allie, of course. (laughs) I remember our daughters, our youngest. And she said, okay, I want you to get up. I want you to get dressed like we're going to church. So that's your more dress up clothes, which of course is not a lot of dress up, but they knew Mm -hmm. they're not staying at home. Yeah. Um, And I want you to come downstairs. I want you to get your wallet, Mm -hmm. put some money in it and come downstairs. They did. And she had paper and pens on the counter. She said, "Um, you're going to write Pam an apology note uh, for what your behavior last night. Well, you know, that 
was onerous. So they're writing these notes and she's making sure the words are spelled correctly. You know, they were that young. <laughs> Put them in an envelope. She said, now um, I want you to go get in the car. So they had no idea what was about to happen. Uh -huh. They get in the car. And once they were all buckled in and she backs out of the driveway, she said, now we're going to Kroger <laughs> and you're going to go into the grocery store and you're going to, each of you are going to buy Pam flowers with your own money. <laughs> and then we're going to drive to her office. Gosh. I, oh gosh, exactly. You can imagine the look yeah. on these two boys' face. Yeah. <laughs> and you are going to go into her office with your note yeah. and the flowers. Yeah. And you're going to apologize. Mm -hmm. Now, I assure you, I wasn't there. They would have preferred <laughs> for us to take all their toys yeah. and their door <laughs> um, and, and just about anything else mm -hmm. in the world then because it felt humiliating. Yeah. But taking things away wouldn't restore the relationship with Pam, yeah. right? Yeah. So they did. So she, she went to the grocery store. They had to spend their own money. They bought flowers, went to the office, of course. Um, it was a one-story office building, and all these people are like, oh, look at those cute kids, mm -hmm. and they're just like dying, yeah. like, mom. And went in, apologized, gave her the flowers and the notes. Relationship restored. Yeah. Do you think we ever had another problem <laughs> when she babied? No. And they weren't upset with her. Yeah. Um, they, they owned it. Yeah. Well, that same, again, that takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes creativity. Yeah. But again, it restored the relationship. And the other thing, and this is the advantage for parents, and then it's over. Yeah. This isn't three weeks from now, two weeks from now, mom, I want my thing. But, you know, mm -hmm. it just, the relationship is restored. So discipline should always be toward relationship restoration. And that changes as they get older, but we can start younger than we think we can. Yeah. And then what a great skill for our children to have yeah. because for the rest of their life, they're going to be damaged or broken relationships and they will know at least how to begin, you know, yeah. patching it up. So Yeah, I love that. I know for Gary and I, we would, we kind of looked at discipline as we, on the other side, we want to, we want a more loving, a healthier, a happier relationship there that you go, yeah. might not be right in the middle of it. But I know my parents, you know, they came from a generation that was very different. And sometimes it was seen and not heard kind of thing yep. or discipline and walk out. And uh, I think if you go into discipline thinking, I want a stronger, healthier, more loving relationship by the end of it, either between me and them or me and who they've mm -hmm. harmed. I love that. Answer. Well, so, the thing is, so that's good. so great because, yeah. again, that, that's the goal. Yeah. And if that's the goal, yeah. then that should dictate what we do. Yes. And if we think taking something away is going to get us there, we'll take something away. Yeah. But in most cases, no. we never did time out. Yeah. I, I mean, I never put my kids on restriction. That just punished us. <laughs> that didn't. They didn't learn anything yeah. other than don't get caught next time. Yeah. And unfortunately, especially middle school, high school years, so much of the discipline we watched parents embrace, mm -hmm. basically just taught their kids, be more careful next time and don't get caught. Yeah. But the relationship with their parents in particular always seemed kind of strange. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I know you and Sandra are very different people. I know Gary and I are really different. Our approach in, uh, to relationships or to parenting and all of that can be very different. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be on the same page, but our kids really need us to be on the same yep. page. So tell me about how you and Sandra achieved that, how you worked together in parenting and didn't let your kids work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, because kids are good at that. They are really I was very that. good at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, to reiterate what you just said about being on the same page, it's probably, I don't know this as an absolute, but I would lean in this direction. It's probably more important to be on the same page mm -hmm. than it is to discipline exactly right. Yeah. So, do, you know, not getting the discipline part exactly right, yeah. but being on the same page is so important. Mm -hmm. um, that unified front is huge. Um, but in terms of being on the same page for us, it was, in some ways it was easy because we were raised in very similar homes. So we were, we already had some momentum in the same direction, but going back, we took, um, we did two things. We took this class and even though we didn't agree with everything in the class, mm -hmm. it forced us to talk about it. And it, it brought up things we would never have thought about mm -hmm. until we were in the middle of it later as parents to decide ahead of time, how would we deal with that? How do we want to respond to that? Do we think that's good advice? Do we think that seems a little bit over the top? So again, it, it forced us to have the conversations ahead of time. And then the second thing is, we, whenever we saw parents get it right, mm -hmm. we would take them to lunch, breakfast, <laughs> dinner. We just could, we were just sponges um, because again, in student ministry, we saw, we those middle school, high school years kind of scared us. Mm -hmm. But when we saw 
parents who just seemed to move through those years effortlessly, even though they had normal kids, it was like, what in the world did you do? So I think something every parent can do is be willing to listen to other parents. And this, and Kendra, you know, you're a mom. This is is so difficult to take advice about raising our own kids from other people. It's so personal. It's so easy to get defensive. Mm -hmm. Um, Unsolicited advice about how to raise your kids. I mean, you know, (laughs) you you don't come out with a scar, (laughs) you know, with a, so, um, but to just be humble enough to realize, okay, at the end game is Mm -hmm. the game. At the end of this, I want to get this right. So if I need to humble myself, you know, not push back, just be a sponge and mm-hmm. learn everything you can. So again, we were kind of on the same page to begin with. We took a, this little course that just forced us to talk about things. And then we we asked every question we could yeah. think of when we saw people do it right. That's so good for parents of young children too, because there's no expectation that you got these children and you know what to do. Like, no. Be on a journey of learning and observing and asking questions and reading, reading yep. all those things. Yep. Yep. And generally speaking, women are more prone to read a book on parenting yep. than men. Mm-hmm. And so for the men, the audience, um, you know, be a student. Yep. And when your wife says, hey, I read this article mm-hmm. or I read this, read this chapter in a book, um, I, I, speaking for men, you know, because of our ego, um, the whole the idea that some other man I've never met who wrote a book can tell me how to raise my sons or my daughters. Yeah. I mean, there's there's just ego pushback, but that's mm-hmm. just pride. Yeah. That is a hundred percent pride. So, guys, read the article, read the books. Um, just just because you had a father doesn't mean you know how to be one. Yeah. Any more than just because you had a surgery no means you know how to perform one. Yeah. Okay. So. We, we come into parenting with mm-hmm. our own background, which can be an asset or a detriment, right? Yeah. Um, so we need to be students, especially in those early years. Yeah. So uh, Gary and I both worked, not when our kids were little. I didn't work outside the home a lot when they were really little, but we both worked most of the time when our kids were growing up. And so we said no to a lot of other social things because Mm -hmm. we wanted to spend a lot of time with our kids. And now that my kids are grown, I just see such big payoff on that. And I really see it honestly, through their teenage years of their willingness or desire just to sit and talk or to Mm -hmm. tell me things or to spend time with their dad or, you know, whatever that was. So So those weren't, they felt like sacrifices. They did because we were busy, you know. But they were investments. Yeah, I Mm -hmm. thought they were important. And And, now— And I'll ask you one more question. Now I benefit from them. Well, you you do. So here's the thing, and this is something for parents to think about. You can't tell me— all the things that you didn't do. Right. Because the the cumulative value of all the things Mm -hmm. that you gave up in order to be there for your kids has no value. No. None. Zero. I don't even remember it. Don't even remember. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So in the moment, it was this evening and it was this thing. But if you put all those things you didn't do together, they would equal nothing as opposed to what you have on this side of being a mom and a grandmom. So Yeah. And honestly, even the people in our life then, many of them are long gone. You know, that seemed maybe important to spend time with. They're just not even in, in our life anymore. So, yeah. So... I know, you know, we did intentional things to carve out that time. It was really difficult. Life is busy, but I'm glad we did. So, Andy, what are the things that you did through the years to carve out meaningful time with your kids? Well, I always tell parents, go with their flow. Yeah. Because your kids, every kid has a flow. Mm-hmm. They just do. And the the temptation, and again, speaking as a father, the temptation as the father is, especially when you have boys, mm-hmm. is to force your boys into your flow which is a mistake because um, one, if you have more than one boy, maybe one boy will be the athlete or be the musician or be the whatever it is that you were. And so it'll be so easy and you'll have so much in common. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have that other son who, or a daughter who's just not interested. Mm -hmm. So I, we tried early on and we learned this from two families that again, who had students in our student ministry, we saw them get this so right where they were so, they lined themselves up behind their kids' interests mm-hmm. instead of trying to get in front and force their own interest on yeah. their kids. So I grew up, I was not an athlete. I, I played one year of little league baseball in the fifth grade and I was the worst player and we were the worst <laughs> team. Okay. So, um, and to this day, you know, mm-hmm. you don't hear me use many sports analogies when I preach because I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I wanted, you know, I thought well, my sons are going to play the guitar and the piano and I can teach them you know, mm-hmm. zero interest. 
Yeah. They wanted to play baseball. Yeah. So I became a baseball coach. And it was so funny because parents, and I was a good baseball coach up yeah. until they went to high school. And parents would always say, Andy, where'd you play baseball? I didn't. Where'd you <laughs> learn all this? Right here on the field. <laughs> I just decided if this is what they're interested in, yeah. this is what I'm interested yeah. in. Um, Allie was super interested in music. So I got to use my interest to, you know, that was a, a connection point with <laughs> us. So figure out their flow, mm -hmm. <laughs> swallow your pride, yeah. and get behind whatever um, they're behind. I have a dear friend who has <laughs> three daughters, daughters, and they're all into, well, two of the three are into competitive cheer. Oh, no. And I thought <laughs> baseball was time-consuming. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. But to hear him talk about his daughters mm -hmm. and all the money and all the hours and all the travel, yeah. but he just said, hey, this is what they're into. I'm, you know, it's not just going to be them and their mom. I'm, yeah. I'm there for it. So, you know, figuring out their, um, their flow. The other thing that I wrote down, um, we camped a lot. And I mean tent camped. Mm -hmm. And this was not something that I ever saw myself doing. But I, again, I heard somebody say many years ago, before, as our kids were very young, you need to camp because when you tent camp, unexpected things always happen. Mm -hmm. And those unexpected things are going to be stories that you tell forever, and they're going to be bonding experiences. So <laughs> I literally found a friend named Bruce, who I knew um, took his kids camping. And I said, Bruce, I need you to take us mm -hmm. camping. I mean, I know how to set up a tent, but mm -hmm. he was like, he was yeah. like way into it. <laughs> and I mean, we camped and camped and camped and camped. And sure enough, I mean, we had injuries, we had accidents, we had, you know, below freezing weather, we had tents collapse. But all of those kind of emergency, small crisis with little kids. Yeah. Those were such bonding moments. Oh, yeah. And of course, Sandra <laughs> loved it because I'd take all three and she had a couple nights, you know, by herself and we'd come home and everything smelled like campfire smoke. And mm -hmm. But um, again, for us, so I, the, the, the takeaway is finding that kind of unusual thing, whether it's fishing or camping yeah. or just something that um, you have to work together. You have to be together for things to turn out. And as much as I enjoyed organized sports, there was always that tension because organized mm -hmm. sports or organized anything because nowadays, is, you know, kids just don't go outside and yeah. play in the cul-de-sac like, you know, we grew yeah. up doing. Yeah. Um, it has a tendency to take away from those weekend activities mm -hmm. or those um, spontaneous activities. So I think trying to figure out the balance with all that's a big deal nowadays as well. Yeah, I love that. I was raised camping. My parents took me a lot too. And you're you still, right. You still remember. I do. Yeah. And G Gary took the kids camping and I can relate to Sandra. I was more than happy to pack up yep. all the food and get it all ready. She went one time. I only and went you know once. what? I, she, <laughs> <laughs> she, well, like here's the all. thing. She went one time. She didn't like it at all. And we didn't yeah. really like her being there. Yeah, Because she, she, everything had to be so careful oh, and so clean. Dirty. And so, That's all you do And is we're clean. like, okay, you can't yeah. camp back camping. Yeah. You, don't, you don't understand camping. Yeah, so. I remember. I only went once too. Slep, you sleep on the ground, all the things. Why? Oh, would yeah. You one time Andrew sliced <gasps> his. Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah. it was gross. I mean, sliced his finger way open. We yeah. had to go get stitches, you know. But again, yeah. that's, uh, we remember, still remember the doctor that stitched him up, up in the mountains. His name is Dr. Han because like hand and he cut his hand anyway. So, the, <laughs> you know, the adventures yeah. go on and on. So. And it's hard to get in the flow with your kids sometimes. I remember my son was really into history. He still is. And I mean, he would follow me around the kitchen while I was cooking, telling me about some queen of England from, you know, years and years, hundreds of years ago. And I had to go learn up on them. Like I learned them in school, but mm -hmm. I was like, I don't even remember those people And anymore. you had to act interested yeah. and then get interested. Yeah. And all my kids had different things like that, yep. that you had to lean in their direction. Yep. That's go so with, good. Yeah, go with their flow. Yeah. Okay. So Andy, how did you keep communication open with your kids? And why did you think that was important? Well, again, this is a little bit of a personality mm -hmm. thing. I mean, uh, just speaking as a man, a father, husband, um, there are men that are more conversive than, than others. I tend to be a words person. Sandra would assure you that I'm the words person more than she is. Yeah. So um, in terms of engaging, it, I think it it just came naturally for me. But in terms of specific things, anytime we have an opportunity to drive our kids somewhere, we should mm -hmm. drive them there. Instead of trying to find somebody else to drive, the drive time, especially when they're old enough to sit in the front seat, it's critical mm -hmm. because there are things you can, you will talk about facing forward in a car mm -hmm. and going back to the previous answer. There are also things you'll talk about around a campfire staring at a fire that you will not talk about face to face. Mm -hmm. So 
that windshield time, um, that's, a, that's a critical time. One of the things I, I wrote down for dad specifically is try to stay out of the habit of only engaging one-on-one with your children when they're in trouble. Mm-hmm. And what happens is when they begin to get older and they have their own friends and they have their own schedule, everybody's going in a different direction without knowing it, but just the gravitational pull of life, you get, you find yourself only Mm -hmm. engaging when something bad has happened or there's a problem to solve or they hear your footsteps Mm -hmm. coming down the hall. They're like, oh no, because he never comes to my room unless I'm in trouble. So you just don't want to get into that habit. And the only way not to is to be intentional about the good times and the the times, you know, when there's not a problem to be solved or somebody to be disciplined. Um, Then the other thing, and I hope I can explain this well, when our kids, and because the question is about staying engaged with Mm -hmm. them, when our kids mess up, especially I would say from 10 years old on certainly middle school and high school, there is usually a way to side with them Mm -hmm. when they have screwed up as opposed to being on the other side of them. And and let me Mm -hmm. try to explain that. So I tried to, I got in the habit early on of when my kids would mess up, they've broken a rule or they've done something at school or they've done something that's offended their mom, Mm -hmm. of instead of initially just siding against them, like, to say, oh, no, mm-hmm. oh, no, because, I mean, they know they're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, no, like put my arm around them like, oh, no, now we got to, so I'm with you yeah. and I'm not the enemy and you're not the enemy. This thing that's happened and how are we going to get through this? If yeah. there is a way to connect emotionally mm-hmm. and to be on their side, and I'll, I'll tell you who used to, I, I saw my dad do this mm-hmm. so often and he didn't say, oh, no, but I always felt like, I was carrying the responsibility of my behavior, and he wanted to help me even when I messed up my first traffic ticket even. He wasn't mad, but Mm -hmm. he wasn't going to pay it. He wouldn't even—I tried to hand it to him. He wouldn't even take it. He's like, flip it over. The instructions are on the back. I'm so sorry this happened. Mm -hmm. So instead of creating an adversarial moment with our children, even when they've messed up, to somehow get on their side Mm -hmm. of this— um, now, there, of course, there's a theological lesson in there because that is what we believe as Christians, that yeah. while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that there was basically, you know, as offensive as sin is to our Heavenly Father, there's a sense in which I'm with you through this. Yeah. When a parent, and maybe especially a dad, mm-hmm. can figure out how to do that, there is something that happens that's so powerful mm-hmm. because kids already know they've messed up. They do not generally don't need to be reminded. And especially if they're already remorseful or broken or afraid, what's the punishment going to be? To create some space to feel bad with them instead of feel bad against them, yeah. it's huge. Yeah. So again, it's it's make sure there's a lot of positive. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. not just negative. And then during the negative to figure out how can there be an, oh no, I'm so sorry you did that yeah. because now this is going to happen. And Mm, I hate that for yeah. you. And so anyway, and, hear, and that's kind of a style thing. I think yeah. everybody's got to figure out their own way of doing that. Yeah. I mean, wh- what my brain goes to right away is that you're creating a lot of safety. You're creating safety for kids to mess up, mm-hmm. to ask you embarrassing questions, yep. to talk about things that they don't understand, but they think you're going to freak out about or all of that. I mean, you're you're really describing like wind chill time is perfect to regularly talk to your kids so that they can look straight ahead. You know they have this embarrassing question. They don't have to look you in the yep. eye and ask you. Yep. Uh, and I, I I just think going to them often and creating like we regularly talk. It's part of our routine that I yep. lay on your bed at night and we just talk about your day or whatever that looks like. That's so important. It Be- just creates safety and, and for it, them. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and then when there's those Mm-hmm. more difficult conversations. Yeah. There's there's relational equity. There's mm-hmm. there's money in the bank. This isn't, mm-hmm. you know, oh, here's that again. Yeah. So, And you and I both know we want our kids to come to us, right? I mean, the issues only grow as they get older, yep. and we want to be that that safe, open. Even if it's hard, I'm on your side, yep. and we're going to figure it out. Yeah, because we yeah. are on their side. We are. I mean, it's real, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But for them to feel that yeah. and learning how to help them feel that, that's that's critical. Yeah. So how did you check in on how your kids were feeling about things? I've heard you talk about this before, like trying to be careful that they weren't carrying around anger or resentment Mm -hmm. or or emotions or feelings or thoughts that would really cause harm to them in the long run, uh, probably against people that don't even care or know about it, you know, uh, later. So how did you make sure you were checking in with your kids regularly? Well, I was 
very intentional about mm-hmm. this. I was so intentional that eventually my daughter, Allie, kind of made fun of me mm-hmm. about this. I'll tell you that story in a second. <laughs> so early on, when we were putting them to bed mm-hmm. one at a time, I began asking them, is everything okay in your heart? Mm-hmm. And the reason I ask, began asking, and I may have started early, I remember the first time that Andrew got his feelings hurt. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget this. We were, had, had a bunch of adults over. He was very little, a toddler. And he walked into the kitchen and he had a look on his face I had never seen before. Mm. And I knew immediately something had hurt his feelings and he didn't know what to do. It was like, what? not physically hurt, but on the inside. So I took him into the living room and I said, Andrew, did somebody hurt your feelings? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I I want to teach my kids what you do. Because if they just get angry, then we're mad because they got angry. You shouldn't talk to your sister that way. But Again, we have to be, try- again, we know adults that yeah. don't, they don't know what to do with what's on the inside. So at night, I would say, um, is everything okay in your heart? Yes, sir, daddy. And then I would say, are you are you mad at anybody? No, sir. Did anybody hurt your feelings today? No, sir. Um, um, are you worried about anything mm-hmm. right now? No, sir. And then I would try to go positive and say, what are you looking forward to? In other words, I... I want you. I wanted them to get a, grow accustomed to thinking about what was on the inside and yeah. learning how to verbalize it. Again, for some people, that's not a problem. Yeah. For others, you know, they struggle their whole lives. So, I did this so consistently. <laughs> One night, I <laughs> I'm in Allie's bedroom and I'm like. <clears throat> Allie, she said, everything's okay with my heart. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not <laughs> jealous of anybody and nobody hurt my feelings. She, she, and there was about three or four more. She just, uh-huh. I'm fine, dad. Okay, I know where this is going. But I'm like, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. Uh-huh. She she knows these are important questions mm-hmm. to ask. It's not just, are you physically hurt? And it's not just what's going on in the outside world. Yeah. Um, and then when, again, they were so young. I At dinner time, we didn't have family devotions. You've heard me talk about mm-hmm. this. I would just tell stories about people that I'd heard about, or I'd sometimes bring email, you know, where sin <laughs> really ruined somebody's life. Yeah. I'd say, listen to what sin did to this guy. And I would read the email and we'd talk about it, like, don't do that. So one night I, t- I read part of an email and told a story about a lady who had a really difficult time growing up and she was very, very angry. Mm-hmm. And I, in, in a simplistic way to my younger children, was explaining she never mm-hmm. got the stuff in her heart out and it just has followed her into adulthood. And this is why it's so important that we, you know, get everything out. We don't keep secrets. We put them to bed. <laughs> uh, you know, less than 10 minutes later, I hear. And it's yeah. it's our middle child, Garrett. He said, Dad, um, there's something I need to tell you. And he told me about something that really wasn't a big <laughs> deal. But he was, and then he went back to bed four times in a row. <laughs> so he's up there thinking, <laughs> okay. What I gotta, is, I gotta get it all out. And the last one, I'll never forget the last one was I'm um, daddy. Um, two days ago I went in Allie's room and I know I'm not supposed to go in there without her permission. <laughs> I said, it's okay. So, but again, I thought this is good. It, yeah. It's like, okay, we need to keep our conscience yeah. clean. Yeah. We need to come. So yeah. We, and so the fourth time we Sandra and I are laughing so hard, but we know we can't he can't see us laughing. We're like, what is it, kid? Dad, I thought of this. So yeah. he was, you know, he was cleaning out. So yeah. again. This is training. Yeah. It's we can't expect people to just be able to talk. Right. So yeah. is everything okay in your heart? Are you mad at anybody? Jealous of anybody? Anybody hurt your feelings? Mm-hmm. And you know, then hey, what are you looking forward to? So that was our way. I don't know if it's the best way, but Well, and we both know the questions you consistently ask your kids, your spouse, your team, whatever that is, it shows what is it what you That's value, exactly what right. you want them to value. Yep. Um so Andy I, I would agree. When my kids were growing up, bedtime was a big deal time. And, you know, sometimes my kids would try to draw out bedtime and I would just kind of let them. I'd lay in bed and let them <clears throat> because I wanted to talk with them. And as my kids grew older, I remember my one son played skip bow on my bed every night, you know, for for years, just bedtime became a time. Mm-hmm. So we decided we wanted all of our parents to learn and, tr- and kind of train them. Our parents like this time is significant and you can ask those consistent questions on a regular basis. And you can kind of unlock some of the stuff that's going on in yep. your kids' hearts. For the very young, you can start teaching them to pray. You can start pointing them that there's wisdom and answers. So we've created a 
a new tool called In the Night Right. Yep. And we are about to give it to all of the parents. Thousands of parents. Thousands of parents in our area churches. And it really was birthed from this idea that we really think if every parent would do nothing else but make a significant moment of bedtime as often as they can and begin to pray with their kids— that that would probably change so much in that relationship yep. with their child and lead them uh, in a great way. So we're excited. That's yeah. coming. Well, the tool's amazing. When you, when I showed up in the office the other day and there was one on my desk, yeah. I immediately opened it up and I thought, what an extraordinary gift to parents mm -hmm. because every parent wants to get this right. Every parent does. Yeah. But, and, and even as much as I know, there were times I just didn't know what to do and I didn't know what to do as they got older mm -hmm. and transitioned. So- uh, creating that bedtime moment is a great idea. And this tool mm -hmm. is a fabulous tool, Kendra. So I just want to say thanks to you and your, you and your whole team for yeah. creating it, coming up with it, yeah. getting it made, and then um, making it available to all the families in our churches. Well, we're excited to give it out. And uh, all I can tell parents as someone who's further down the road, you are not going to regret that. That's time. right. You're not going to regret that habit. Nope. That paid off in multiple conversations through my kids' teenage years, even now, my older children put their kids to bed and call me sometimes like it's just a rhythm wow. that they have. Not all the time, but sometimes. And they know it's a space. It's yep. a space we've held, right? Okay. So just to kind of come to the end here, when you think about parenting and your kids are all in their young 20s now, moving out, owning their own places. Uh, yep. What would you say for you, maybe that's something you and Sandra even talked about, is like your end goal for parenting? Well, we actually had established a goal. We were, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew was in a car seat. That's our oldest. So we had Andrew in a car seat. This is how long ago it was. He's 28 now. And we're driving to um, Hilton Head, South Carolina to meet her family for vacation. And I said, we need some family goals. And um, I, I'm not a goal setter. So this was unusual. So uh -huh. we had this long conversation and um, we came up with some ideas, but because of what I saw in her family, not my family, but mm -hmm. in her family, her family, she has a brother and sister, all five of them loved to be together. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, we were old enough to be married. Her sister was about to get married. So they're all grown. And they love being together so much that if all of them were together and one of them wasn't there, they would call the other person and kind of make fun of them, say, our, you know, we're having dinner tonight. It is so good. We're so sorry you're not here. And I thought, I love that. And I we didn't have that. So um, we decided that our North Star for our parenting was that our kids would want to be with us and with each other when they no longer had to be. Yeah. That they would want to be with each other and with us when they no longer had to be. That is when they were grown and they could be anywhere they wanted to be, doing anything they wanted to do, mm -hmm. that they would still desire to be with us and together. Yeah. Now, that, that informed so many of our decisions. And I think it's why we very quickly realized, well, then discipline, discipline isn't about behavior modification because here's what every parent knows. If you have perfectly behaved children yeah. who do not want to be with you, that is a parenting fail. <laughs> yes, that is not a, a win, right? Yeah. You, you would rather have kids who have the normal misbehavior, yeah. get into trouble problems. But when they hit 18, 19, 20, 21, they love each other yeah. and they love their mom and dad and they want to be together. So yeah. behavior modification is not a good goal. No. Um, relationship is. So when we decided our ultimate goal is that when our kids no longer have to be with us and with each other, they would want to be because they enjoy each other. I'm telling you, that, that informs so many of our decisions and it made it so much easier, going back to what we, where we started, to say no for now, not forever, mm -hmm. to be creative with our discipline. Um, and to make sure they knew how to honor their mother, which meant they would know how to honor one another. Because a culture of honor, whether it's in, at work, in the community, on a team, at home, a culture of honor is magnetic. Mm -hmm. And a culture where honor is missing um, is not. People do not want to be in an environment where they are not respected and honored. So um, that was that was our North Star from day one because really of what I saw in Sandra's family. Yeah. So parents, I hope that you know that uh, Andy and I, both our kids are on the grown-up end of things and we're, we're being able to enjoy this part of our family. But lots of mistakes were made by both of us in parenting. Oh goodness, you will get yeah. so many things that you don't do exactly right. But if that relational thread is like you're guiding your North Star, yep. it will pay off. Yeah. It and will pay off. 
when we get it wrong, yeah. apologizing to our kids, yeah. restoring that relationship yeah. is training and it's modeling. Yeah. And it's the parent, especially the dads that are too proud yeah. to step over the line and restore the relationship. They model what they really aren't going to want their kids to embrace later no. because it will come back to haunt them. Yeah. So. Because yeah. there will be difficulty. There will yes. be there will be conflict teaching yep. them to restore that is so important. Yep, I agree. Andy, thank you so much for talking oh, yeah. with us today. This was so helpful. Our parents are going to walk away with lots of good ideas. Well, it's fun, and you made it easy. And I would just say one thing to mm-hmm. parents. Um, I always say to leaders that my goal is not to try to fill anybody else's cup, mm-hmm. but to simply empty mine. Yeah. And so today um, we have emptied ours, and I certainly hope it was helpful. Yeah, everything we know. All right, parents, thank you so much for listening. So my challenge to you is to take one thing from this interview, one habit or one new priority that you would like to bring into your family. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. 